spell uh, your first name? And with uh, Acadians, of course, it's a, a capital B, so it's a capital L, cap E, capital B, L A N C. And the commissioner is well aware of the spelling of uh, Acadian names. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give is uh, the truth, uh, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do swear. Thank you. Bonne Minister LeBlanc, do you recall being interviewed by the Commission Council on February 22nd, 2024? I do. Right. And if I could ask uh, that WIT 65 be called up. Minister, this is a summary of, uh, of the publicly disclosable information from that uh, interview. If, have you had a chance to review the summary? Uh, yes, I have. And is it accurate? It is. And will you adopt it as uh, part of your evidence before the Commission? I will. Thank you. And next, if we could go to WIT 52. This is a summary, um, Minister, of your in-camera in examination. Have you had an opportunity to review this summary? Yes, I have. And is it accurate? Yes, it is. And will you adopt it as part of your evidence before the Commission? I will. Thank you. You've had a number of roles in government, a number of roles in cabinet. Um, I will uh, try and take you through what I understand your various positions have been since approximately uh, August of 2018. And please correct me if I get uh, any of this wrong. Um, I understand that in August of 2018, you were appointed Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs and you held that position until uh, 2019. Is that right? Yes. And after the election in, uh, in 2019, you were appointed president of what was then the Queen's Privy Council uh, for Canada, which included responsibilities for democratic institutions. That's correct. In the summer of 2020, you were appointed Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, and you served in those offices as uh, Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs and with responsibility for democratic institutions until the 2021 election. That's right. All right. And after the 2021 election, you were appointed Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs and retained responsibility for democratic institutions. That's right, and I had the infrastructure and communities portfolio attached as well. Thank you for that addition. And in 2023, uh, you were appointed Minister of Public Safety, Democratic Institutions, and Intergovernmental Affairs. That's right. All right. Glad I didn't uh, leave any of the, you have the, the, the record for longest title, I think. I have a hard time keeping a job. <laughs> Given the scope of uh, this stage of the proceedings, I'll focus my questions today primarily on your responsibilities uh, in relation to democratic institutions. Um, can you describe your role or mandate uh, in relation to, uh, to, to that portfolio? Les institutions démocratiques. Democratic institutions are a secretariat within the Privy Council to and they develop uh, policies, uh, consider uh, legislative changes uh, that may be needed to support uh, the capacity of Canadians to hold free and fair elections. And uh, it's a, a public policy uh, function. And of course, uh, Elections Canada is an independent agency and looks after the operations. But it's a way that the government and the executive uh, interact uh, with uh, the elections uh, apparatus in Canada. Thank you. Uh, I would ask my questions in English. Language of your choice. <laughs> Excuse me. We heard this morning from your co colleague, uh, Minister Gould, about uh, um, her work in uh, developing the plan to protect uh, democracy. Uh, did your responsibilities in relation to democratic institutions include uh, reviewing or updating that plan? Um, yes, they did. Uh, she was the minister uh, in the lead up to the 2019 general election. She, I remember as a minister her coming to cabinet with that, with that plan. I remember conversations uh, with her as a colleague around that work. Um, and after the 2019 election, when I 
took over that responsibility. One of uh, the mandates that I got was uh, to review the, how the plan had uh, worked in the 2019 election uh, and come back to Cabinet with any suggested changes or uh, adjustments for the upcoming election. We were then in a minority parliament, so we wanted to have those measures in place. And did part of that uh, include reviewing uh, what we've heard referred to as the Judd Report, the uh, May 2020 assessment on the critical election incident public protocol? Yes, it did. That was a deliberate decision made by the government to have an independent review by a very senior public servant, former deputy minister, director of, the, of CSIS. Uh, so once we got Mr. Judd's report, I worked with the senior officials at the Privy Council office uh, to make any adjustments that Mr. Judd recommended. We also had the benefit of a National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians report. So that work went into uh, the sort of second version or 2.0 version of what Karina Gould had uh, had taken to Cabinet two years previously. Thank you. And, and just for the benefit of, uh, of the participants, the Judd report can be found at CAN 900. We don't need to bring it up. I would ask the court operator to bring up COM 48. And this is a, um, a report entitled Countering uh, an Evolving Threat that I think, uh, Minister, you'll be quite familiar with. I realize it was produced uh, sometime later. But if we could just go to page uh, 20 of that document. It contains a review of uh, uh, different recommendations that have been made by NSI, or <coughs> excuse me, some of the, uh, the entities that we've listed this morning, including uh, uh, the Judd report. Um, you mentioned, uh, Minister, that you adopted or recommended adopting a number of the recommendations made, by, um, made in that report. One recommendation I understand that was not implemented, if we just scroll down a, a bit on this page, as what's listed as number two, that the protocol would cover the pre-writ pre uh, period. Can you explain why that uh, particular recommendation was not implemented? Um, so that would have been based on advice that I would have received from senior officials uh, at the Privy Council office. Um, in a context uh, where we're not in an election period where a writ hasn't been issued. There's a basic principle of ministerial responsibility. Uh, ministers uh, are in office and have responsibility, uh, including around foreign interference, uh, the national security agencies um, are empowered to work with the minister who's in office. Uh, this was very much and deliberately designed to be something that would be in effect during a, a caretaker period. It's a convention uh, of British parliamentary democracy where the government is in it itself a candidate to succeed itself. So in, an, in a government's act with a great deal of restraint during a writ period, as is absolutely appropriate, um, that's why the panel uh, and the protocol uh, was deliberately designed to exist at a period where the elected government uh, perhaps shouldn't be the best arbiter of public pronouncements on the conduct, uh, conduct of an election. All right. Let me turn to um, a next topic, which is uh, to ask you about uh, whether and when you received a classified intelligence uh, in your capacity uh, as uh, Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs and with responsibilities for a democratic institutions. Do I understand that that would it would be rare for you to, to receive uh, classified intelligence or classified briefings? Um, yes, the Minister of Democratic Institutions uh, is not uh, a regular consumer of intelligence products or intelligence uh, documents or briefings from intelligence officials. Um, and I've had a perspective on that since I became the Minister of Public Safety last summer. I now see the difference between the operational responsibility of a minister responsible for CSIS or, or the RCMP uh, and a minister responsible for democratic institutions. The democratic institutions portfolio, I did receive high level uh, briefings from officials on a number of occasions, uh, 
I think the first one was in March of 2020. Uh, I think literally on the eve of the declaration of the pandemic. I, one tends to remember those moments. Um, but it was a, a high-level situational awareness of the threat landscape. Uh, it was my first opportunity to hear from them how uh, what they had seen uh, in terms of threat actors uh, and potential attempts to interfere uh, in the election of 2019. Uh, but it didn't, it, it was to situate my understanding of the threat landscape of the, of the particular state or non-state actors that are active in this space, uh, but it didn't go into granularity around specific constituencies or specific events. It was a higher level briefing, um, probably so as in your reference to the Judd report and other work that we would do as we were thinking through how we wanted to uh, adjust the protocol uh, and the protecting democracy plan uh, for the subsequent election. This was a sort of a introduction for me to the threat landscape. That was an intelligence briefing, but it was at a much higher level than, for example, the public safety minister would typically receive. All right. We'll, we'll go through that briefing in just a moment. But um, uh, we heard uh, from Minister Gould uh, this morning that uh, in developing the uh, plan to protect democracy, she had uh, sort of monthly meetings, she estimated, with uh, CSA, CSE, um, the Privy Council Office, uh, received information from RRM. Um, I understand you did not receive, uh, and those were, to be clear, sort of high level, as you've described, uh, briefings, not sort of specific uh, incidents or um, specific geographical areas or things of that sort. I understand you did not have sort of these regular monthly uh, uh, briefing sessions. Can you explain the difference in approach? It's probably three explanations. The first one is uh, in September of 2019, I had a stem cell transplant uh, to deal with a very aggressive and rare form of blood cancer. Uh, so when I became minister, I was literally, uh, uh, I came from Montreal and went back to Montreal the same day. Um, so I was recovering uh, in terms of my own health. Uh, the assessment was that the plan that Karina had put in place had worked. Uh, the initial information was that it had been successful. We recognized that we needed to adjust or tweak or take into account recommendations from the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians or Mr. Judd. Um, so that was less uh, of an undertaking than building a plan from scratch. Before uh, Karina Gould had put together the Protecting Democracy Plan, nothing of the sort had existed. So she built the infrastructure from scratch. Uh, it was the first time the federal government had set up these mechanisms to detect and disrupt foreign interference, the public protocol. So these were all new elements. We were satisfied generally with how they had worked. We recognized that we had committed to reviewing and adjusting them, which is what I did. And then along came COVID as well. Uh, COVID literally happened, I think the day, the pandemic was the day after my first briefing. Like many Canadians, I returned to New Brunswick. My health was still fragile, uh, recovering from the transplant. Um, and uh, we were building the communications infrastructure as a government to allow uh, ministers to receive classified information from residences. Um, so that quickly changed. and. Uh, by the fall, uh, everybody was in a much different routine. But the need for the monthly briefings or to travel to uh, California to meet the social media companies uh, was much different after she had, in our view, successfully done that work. All right, let's turn to that March uh, 2020 briefing. If uh, the court operator could pull up CAN 15506. This is a, a memo. The memo is dated uh, March 9th, 2020. It is a memorandum to the National Security and Intelligence Advisor, uh, and I understand represents uh, the notes for the NSIA 
uh, for a security briefing to you um, in your capacity as pre president of the Queen's Privy Council Office. And we heard uh, some evidence yesterday that briefing notes are not always uh, strictly um, uh, strictly applied to. So I, I just want to go through this document and understand uh, what uh, topics were or were not uh, covered in, in that briefing. Um, if we look at the summary on the first page, it indicates that the purpose of the meeting would be to provide you with a summary of election security related activities undertaken to help safeguard the 2019 election, as well as an overview of the threat environment, particularly as it pertains to foreign interference. Does that uh, accord with your memory of the, the purpose of the briefing? Yes, it does. And the summary also indicates in the third bullet point that the uh, December mandate letter that you had received specified that you were to lead a review of the measures put in place to protect the electoral process and bring forward uh, recommendations. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And does that uh, accord with uh, uh, your memory of the December mandate letter that you had received? Yes, it does. All right. And then in the bullet point below that, um, indicates that Ms. Bruce, who I understood was then the head of the, the CSE, and Mr. Vigneault, the director of CSIS, would expand upon potential threats observed in uh, GE 2019. Um, do you remember whether Ms. Bruce and, uh, Ms. Bruce and Mr. Vigneault were at the at briefing and provided you, and did they provide you with uh, some information on the potential threats observed during the 2019 election? Yes, they did. Okay. If we go to page three of that document, um, just scrolling to the bottom of the page, there's a, a text box there indicating there is uh, some discussion of a, a threat reduction measure that the government of Canada had it conducted in advance of the 2019 election. Do you recall receiving information about that, uh, about that TRM in this meeting? I don't recall details of that uh, a discussion around threat reduction measures, or uh, I see that it references the government of Pakistan. I don't have a specific recollection of a conversation about CSIS threat reduction measures. All right. And then if we go to page eight of the document, If we scroll just a little bit further down, there's a, a title uh, indicating what we saw. Um, and the bullets indicate that uh, we did not observe any activities. And I presume, sorry, I should just to put this in context, um, there's a discussion above about uh, the site task force and the panel of five's work. Uh, so I am assuming, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that this, when the we addressed here is, is the, the panel. Uh, we did not observe any activities that met the threshold for a public announcement or affected Canada's ability to have a free and fair election, including in the online space. Is that uh, something that you recall being briefed on in this meeting? Uh, yes, I do. And as I, that was one of the most significant takeaways uh, for me from that sort of first high-level briefing is that some of the most senior intelligence and security officials in the country confirmed to me their view uh, that the 2019 election was free and fair and that any attempts at foreign interference would not have uh, affected the outcome of the election, uh, including in specific in individual riding. So I remember being reassured that the plan that we had put in place uh, in their view, in their independent senior official view, uh, had been successful. And the next pull-up point down, do you recall that being said as well? Uh, that is not the same as saying we saw nothing at all. Uh, yes, that's why I said the idea that there have been attempts or is not new. This had existed for over a decade. Um, and and they, they would talk about uh, that sort of overall threat landscape. But the takeaway for me, I thought, was significant. Your first bullet that the election had been free and fair and decided by Canadians in Canada. Turning to page 10 of this document, 
Uh, we see a, a, a heading labeled China threat update, and there are a number of uh, largely redacted bullets. The third down, uh, third bullet down is bolded and says specific incidents suggestive of foreign interference, which were br briefed to relevant clients, uh, government of Canada and political parties during the RIP period, e.g. Don Valley. Do you recall uh, being briefed on anything specifically related to Don Valley? As I said, and uh, the first time that I saw this document was when I was preparing for these uh, hearings. So as a minister who receives a briefing from the officials, I don't see the notes that they've prepared uh, by their colleagues for the meeting. So the first time that I knew that they had such uh, notes, it was honestly uh, when I was preparing uh, for this hearing. And when I looked at your document, so I think I also understand that this section here, it was, uh, for example, if you need any other information, uh, it would be uh, uh, a supplement to the main uh, document. And as I said, my impression was that they wanted to give me a broader perspective uh, with respect uh, to uh, the threat context, but uh, I do not uh, remember at all that we went into such precise details uh, for a g given riding and uh, that a specific country had done uh, something, uh, was alleged to have done something in a riding. So the first time that I did hear about the allegations with respect to this riding was when it was public uh, following the leaks, and it, uh, last year it came out. Uh, Next questions you may be able to answer uh, quite quickly, if uh, given um, that you've indicated it was really a more high-level or global-type briefings. I'm um, turning away specifically from this this document. Can I ask you whether I'll ask the court operator to pull up uh, some uh, three? Minister, there was a number of. Uh, uh, summaries produced uh, for the purposes of this commission on various issues relating to uh, the 2019 and 2021 elections. And I'll just ask you uh, very briefly uh, to indicate whether or not you were aware of intelligence relating to these uh, various issues um, at the time uh, of the 2019 and then 2021 elections. So this first one relates to um, uh, potential interference in the Vancouver area and specifically the use of, uh, at paragraph three, the use of proxy agents to exclude candidates from community events. Was this uh, the type of uh, intelligence that you would have been briefed on um, in 2020 or um, after the, uh, sometime after the 2019 election? Yeah, and, and in your introduction, you said like, before the 2019 election. So I would not have had even this level of detail uh, before the 2019 uh, election, uh, when I became minister responsible for democratic institutions, so after the 2019 election, um, provide the briefings. Uh, it was certainly they were focusing on on China uh, as one of the most uh, uh, frequent uh, countries in terms of attempting to interfere. Um, I don't remember details of local community events in the city of Vancouver. Um, again, I, I, the first time I saw these summaries was preparing uh, for this hearing, and there are a long list of caveats that you can't figure out from this summary. We don't know at what particular moment this intelligence information was gathered. Uh, we don't have the context of other pieces of information. We're not sure if it's a single source if it was corroborated. So I, I want to be careful not to comment on these specific things other than having looked at the summaries uh, before before my appearance today. I understand. And I, I, I don't want to ask you about the substance of any of the intelligence. I'm, I'm really just looking uh, uh, or seeking to understand whether these are, you would have been briefed on uh, these issues um, in your capacity as uh, having responsibilities for democratic institutions. So, so, so they, they would have, for example, talked about proxy agents, and that is one of the ways that different hostile actors uh, attempt to uh, interfere. Uh, I would have 
understood that China was very present in that kind of activity. But I, was it in the city of Vancouver and was somebody kept out of a community event? That I would not have known. Understood. And if we could um, bring up some uh, dot 10, please. This is a, a summary, uh, Minister, in relation to PRC threat actors, contact with candidates, and uh, funding of threat actors. It mentions uh, 11 candidates, 13 political uh, staff, um, and a transfer of uh, $250,000. Were you uh, briefed uh, in relation, or did you had you been briefed in relation to these uh, to this body of intelligence uh, in your capacity and uh, as responsible for democratic institutions. So again, I I wouldn't comment on specific uh, allegations. In this case, I learned uh, about this when it became public following some leaks. Uh, so I would not have been briefed in this level of granularity. Um, but as I say, I, I also think it's important that people not think we are confirming stuff that appeared in particular leaks that, uh, of intelligence information. I think it just merits saying that uh, I took note of the public discussion of these issues. Right. Um, and turning to uh, 2021 now, I'll ask the court operator to bring up some uh, four. And this is a summary, um, Minister, that describes uh, some of the allegations of misinformation or a disinformation campaign targeting uh, Aaron O'Toole, Kenny Chu, and the Conservative Party of Canada. And I, I want to ask whether uh, in the uh, months or weeks after the 2021 election, were you um, aware of, uh, um, were you aware of the intelligence uh, summarized in uh, this summary? Uh, again, I, I knew uh, that China used social media platforms and particularly WeChat uh, to propagate campaigns of disinformation and misinformation. Um, but the first time I learned about the specific allegations, either with respect to Mr. O'Toole, uh, or Mr. Chu was following, again, the public uh, release the, of this information. And then there were subsequent meetings uh, in the fall of 2022, I think, and certainly in the spring of 2023, uh, where we were taken into some more detail, a small group of ministers. All right. And so turning then to those, uh, we'll jump ahead then to those briefings, um, and I'll take you specifically to uh, one that was held in May of 2023, and that's CAN 17676. <laughs> if you can scroll to the uh, second page, please. These are, I, I realize these are not your notes, uh, Minister, uh, but, but we heard but some... But Brian Clough has pretty good handwriting. <laughs> he does indeed. <laughs> so we heard some evidence from uh, Mr. Clough yesterday that these were notes that he, he made during uh, a briefing on May 18th, and I understand that you were, uh, your name is listed at the top, and I understand you were at this, this briefing? I was. All right. And um, the document, or the notes refer to... Um, uh, some uh, expressions of uh, or partisan preferences, um, shifting, uh, or wanting to punish. I'm looking at the first, uh, sorry, in the middle of the page under discussion of media leaks. Uh, there's PRC, no threats of physical harm to MPs or families. Uh, the next line down, PRC wanted to punish LPC, shift to CPC, um, and some further discussion of shifting back to LPC. Was uh, this the first uh, time you had been briefed on um, intelligence relating to shifting uh, uh, partisan preferences expressed by the PRC? Uh, yes, it was. That was the first time I would have heard that level of granularity. I remember being quite skeptical um, that an intelligence 
briefing would be able to uh, discern the shifting preferences of a country uh, in another country's election. I've been in enough elections uh, where a lot of people claim to have influence uh, or to be involved in either a successful or an unsuccessful election and having uh, played a critical role where in some cases it's exaggerated. So that's part of a free uh, and open democratic discussion. I, but I do remember the officials offering up that, that, uh, that piece of intelligence at that meeting. All right. And there's also, I see a note uh, at, towards the bottom of the screen right now, FI in DVN 2019 nomination. Is this the first time you would have uh, heard at that sort of granular level about uh, particular intelligence relating to the uh, nomination process in uh, 2019 and DVN? Yes, I think it was. Okay. And uh, at the bottom of the screen now, there's reference to the 11 candidates and uh, a reference to $250,000 is, again, this is the first time you would have heard with that level of granularity about that, um, yes, that allegation. Yes, it was. All right. And uh, scrolling to the next page, you could, sorry. Uh, the second unredacted line there, disinformation campaigns did exist. I can't conclude direct impact on certain results. Um, and above that, there's a, a list of various uh, uh, media outlets. Um, is this the first time you would have heard about uh, intelligence relating to a disinformation uh, campaign in 2021? Uh I don't disagree with Brian's notes. I think there was a meeting uh, in in February, in the winter of that same year. I, I don't have those notes in front of me, and I just want to make sure I don't say, yeah, that was the first time, and then uh, there's a note referencing. This Fair was the first time that I remember hearing about ridings, allegations around money exchanging, disinformation campaigns and China using social media platforms was something that we'd heard a lot about for a considerable amount of time. Um, but this may have been the first time when they went into detail of the targets, the particular uh, elements of the disinformation that was used. Thank you. And I, I don't mean to suggest it was, you may well have heard uh, um, about this at an earlier briefing, but it was uh, well after 2021. It would have only been after uh, various media leaks. Is that fair to say? Yes, oh. yes. It, it, th this level of granularity started after uh, m some of these allegations were uh, in, in the public domain. Thank you. And would, uh, just to conclude, would having knowledge of this type of information, this level of granularity, had be would it have benefited your review of the uh, implementation of the plan to protect democracy in 2019 and your efforts to update that plan that you spoke about earlier um, uh, for 2021 would have having this level of uh, information about the nature and extent of threats of foreign interference have benefited uh, your efforts in reviewing and developing uh, the plan 2.0 as you put it. I'm not sure that this level of granularity would have made a significant difference. Uh, the senior officials at the Privy Council office who worked with me uh, talked to their colleagues in the Intelligence Secretariat at Privy Council office, and I assume uh, with the national security agencies. I certainly believed in the discussions I had with them. Uh, they gave me a sufficiently a precise uh, picture of the threat landscape of the countries that were uh, active in, in the particular foreign interference space. Um, and the measures that, that we wanted to, to be put in, to be adjusted or uh, tweaked following Mr. Judd's report or the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians um, were validated by the fact that we had Mr. Judd uh, and uh, the members of the panel themselves confirming that in their views, the, the measures that had been in place had worked, had been successful. Um, so I had every confidence that I had all of the information I needed uh, and my colleagues at Privy Council Office, the senior officials that helped me uh, 
go to cabinet with the adjusted version of the plan. Uh, we're well aware of what we needed to to ask cabinet to make the changes, largely uh, based on uh, Mr. Judd's review. And Mr. Judd would have had all of this granularity. So uh, I had very much confidence in his experience in this area. He had a long and distinguished experience in this area. Uh, and I was told that he had been taken through all of this detail. I was satisfied to rely uh, on his advice and the advice of the deputy ministers at Privy Council office when we went to cabinet for the amended uh, or the adjusted plan. Those are all my questions, Commissioner. Thank you. We'll break for lunch. And uh, we'll come back at uh, 2.20. Order, please. Alors, s'il vous plaît. This hearing is in recess until 2.20. La séance est en pause jusqu'à 14h20. This sitting of the Foreign Interference Commission is Well, we just resumed, but I forgot my notes. Just a second, I'll be back. Before we start the cross-examination, I just want to specify one thing. Uh, the question uh, that I've been asked of and the answer, that I've, the answer that I've been given by Minister Blair regarding the media report concerning the uh, CISIS warrant um, were outside the scope of this stage of the Commission work and no findings will be made on these matters in the initial report. Cross-examination. First one is Jenny, counsel for Jenny Kwan. Minister LeBlanc, uh, my name is Sujit Chaudhary. I'm counsel for uh, Jenny Kwan, MP for Vancouver East. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I just have five minutes, so a couple of quick questions. Uh, the first is you've probably seen reports about the CSIS director's talking points that we uh, examined yesterday with the PMO panel. I just have a question about those, a, a quick one. that are dated February 21st, 2023. And it's CAN 4495. And just ever received a briefing from the director. Uh, and maybe if it would help. And in particular, it's on pages five and six. There's some conclusions, if you can scroll down. Yeah, so there's three conclusions listed on page five. And then there's two conclusions on page six. And uh, we, we're just wondering if you ever received a briefing from the director that covered those five points. Well, then, if you want me to speak to all five of them, let's go back to sure, the first three. Course, if I could go back up yeah. to the first three. Yeah. Because this, you'll appreciate the first time I saw this document was when I was preparing for these. Of course, sir. Yes. And I was not in that briefing that the Prime Minister would have had. Yeah. Okay, can I see the last two again? Sure, of course. Thank you. Uh, 
And your question and again? So my quick question is, did you ever receive a, a briefing from the CSIS director that um, addressed any of those five points or already communicated those five points? Uh, not in that context at all. My first briefing with the CSIS director as Minister of Democratic Institutions, um, level sort of analysis of the threat uh, landscape. Um, since I became Minister of Public Safety, uh, uh, I talked to the director of CSIS uh, about these issues with more precision than the Minister of Democratic Institutions at the time. He talks to me uh, about things that um, we've always said that the threat evolves, that the kind of uh, the nature of the threat and the particular uh, ways that hostile state or non-state actors attempt to interfere evolve. And he talks to me about what CSIS is doing to keep up with the evolving threat. So that would be the context of my conversations with him. Okay, thank you. Well, that's actually a good segue to my next question, which is so, uh, Metra Drouin was here uh, testifying in her capacity, her most recent role as NSIA, and uh, and she offered an observation at the end of her cross examination w w with me. She said that you know it's been two years, uh, two and a half years um, since. Uh, 2021, um, there's, uh, and our, our understanding of foreign interference continues to evolve as to the kind of threat it might pose today uh, as to what it might have posed in 2021, let alone in 2019. And so the, and I know that you've been working on a, you've issued a report with Madame Charette uh, about uh, steps forward. And so I'm hoping I can ask you a couple of questions. Uh, on that theme of what our current understanding of foreign interference is and what, how we might respond today. Uh, and so the first is a question that's been put to other uh, members of the government, but we'll put to you as well. And if we could call up now, it's in the document database. Good. And is we can... Yes, that's it. Thank you. So threat levels chart. And so the question, which is a high threshold and a single threshold, this in the in the counterterrorism context, we use a spectrum. And uh, with kind of a, a graduated set of responses. And so is this type of framework an alternative to the high single threshold model that would be used for foreign interference? Is it something we should consider or look at carefully? So, and I, my colleague, uh, Karina Gould, would have talked about that this morning when she was the Minister of Democratic Institutions and brought forward the first Protecting Democracy Plan, which had the public protocol, the threshold is deliberately set at a high level. Um, it's an extraordinary moment in the middle of an election campaign where a group of five senior public servants chaired by the secretary to the cabinet, the most senior nonpartisan public servant in the country, uh, a potential threat of foreign interference that in their the ability of Canadians to have a free and fair election, including um, so the threshold has to be deliberately want a robust public discourse moments in a country's democratic evolution, and that's positive. You want to encourage robust debate uh, and having a weekly comment from a panel of the most senior public servants or regular commentary would be an extraordinary moment and done at anything less than a high threshold in our view uh, might might undermine confidence in the election. So that's why it's deliberately set that high and that's why I don't think a comparison to a terrorism threat 
uh, uh, level is, is a valid comparison. During the election campaign, the national security agencies are still very much, according to law, doing their job at detecting and disrupting foreign interference. You're going to the ultimate instrument of a public declaration by uh, the panel of five. I think it's important to know that the work is being done on a regular and effective basis throughout the election period and obviously before the election as well. So one follow-up question, Minister, because, sorry. Yes, yeah, so yeah, of course. So, so just to put this back to you, it could be that at the critical level, there is a public announcement by the panel of five, but beneath that, there's different types of communications that might not be of that character to parties, to candidates, to different entities. So there is a, there's a more complicated, a more complex set of tools protocol that might evolve in response to the record. And the question is? Uh, and so quite, it, kind of the all or nothing approach where it's a, a five where there's communications to parties, to candidates, to affected communities that maybe don't have the same. Well, I, I think you, as I said, you want to be careful in an electoral context before uh, intelligence uh, public context. You know that there's a, a security cleared representatives of each political party that can meet uh, with uh, representatives of the intelligence and security community. Uh, Elections Canada has access to these officials as well. Um, I don't think that you can... Uh, I don't think that you can have a, a spectrum of public comment. Uh, it either reaches the threshold where in the independent professional judgment of these five senior officials, they are required to inform the public because in their judgment, our ability to conduct a free and fair election in a riding or nationally is affected. I don't think you take steps along that road. It's a nest candidates respond to allegations, candidates disagree with other candidates posts. Uh, that's part of a normal, robust democratic discussion. And having intelligence services or senior public officials commenting in, in a public way in an election, in our view, has to be because in their independent judgment during the caretaker period, they think that something has happened that impedes the ability of Canadians to have a free and fair election. And it's important to note that in 2019 and 2021, in their judgment, they did not think that was the case. Good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, good afternoon, Minister. My name is Tom Jarman. I good represent Aaron O'Toole. Uh, I just got a couple of questions. Um, during the period from you were serving your duties as Minister of Democratic the intelligence precincts you received were high level as opposed Yeah, they were high level uh, three. There was discussions of different state, hostile state and non-state actors that were active in this space, but uh, it didn't go down into details uh, around specific ridings uh, uh, or specific geographical regions. Okay, thank you. And uh, this morning when uh, Minister Gould testified, she talked about uh, the relationship she developed with uh, Facebook, Twitter and Microsoft, and I guess Google as well. Um, in order to come to this voluntary protocol with respect to the 2019 election. Um, was that reviewed after the 2019 election? Uh, yes, it was reviewed uh, by the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians and by Mr. Judd uh, in his review. Uh, the, the, the voluntary uh, undertaking that Ms. Gould got from the major social media platforms was reviewed, and in fact, in 2021, we also added uh, others to that space. 
Yes. And what steps were taken to add uh, foreign ent enterprises like uh, Tencent and ByteDance who are did in the National Security and Intelligence uh, recognized that there was a, a threat of dis some foreign state and non-state actors uh, were particularly active. Um, that is a process in uh, a moment where social media has taken on such significant importance and has such a significant impact. Um, but members of the site task force and others Uh, with the social media platforms. A period where the government is in is ones that would have those conversations in the and sent been asked to enter into the same relationships with uh, as Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft, and Google. I, I want to be careful before getting in. I'd, I'd want to I don't want to talk about specific discussions that may have happened with intelligence uh, officials who, who are the ones that are best placed uh, to give this advice to the government. Um, but we have participated, for example, uh, in a G7 effort, the Rapid Response uh, Mechanism. Canada was a global leader in this space. There was the Paris Call for Trust in Democracy, where I participated uh, quickly or soon after becoming Democratic Institutions Minister uh, with other uh, countries. It's a live conversation with our Five, uh, ally, five Eyes uh, partners about what we can do in terms of sharing information around different A complicated space. You'll appreciate that it's not easy for one country to uh, uh, in this area. That's why the most countries, uh, and there's increasingly an G7 partners uh, to work in this space together. Um, we took our responsibility. Uh, to do everything that we could. Uh, and I, I would think that certainly the work that Ms. Gould did told us that the major social media platforms uh, want to ensure that they're not uh, participating in activities or, or being used uh, in a way that disinformation or misinformation campaigns uh, could affect negatively the outcome of an election. Uh, but it's, it's a constant challenge for democratic governments around the world, uh, and it's an active conversation that I've had with counterparts uh, in other countries as well. Great. That's my time. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Next one is uh, Council for RCDA, Metzirois. Bonjour. Bonjour. Euh, ministre Leblanc, vous avez été impliqué dans le développement du mandat de la précédente commission, n'est-ce pas? Oui. You were involved in the mandate of this commission, Mr. Leblanc. So, the commission was set up with great care. Could you repeat your question, please? Question. Each word was picked with great caution. We all agreed with each word in uh, the terms of reference and the mandate you just quoted. The Commission to investigate foreign interference uh, by uh, China, among other state actors. So, 
So is the government aware of uh, similar allegations uh, uh, when Russia interfered with the 43rd and 42nd? I will not comment on the publications on allegations in the public domain about uh, allegations of particular intelligence. It is known in the public domain that Russia is particularly involved in disinformation and misinformation campaigns in other contexts and in cyber attacks. I am referring to what is in the public domain. And um, earlier, in other countries, we saw allegations allegations of Russians' involvement in such threats, but I will not comment on the specifics of Russian interference, um, but I will say, as, it was, as was said publicly, that Russia was quite active in other circumstances, and we wanted to make sure that all appropriate measures of protections were available in Canada. Question, there are other questions. why we don't just mention China. general election answer. I didn't say that Russia didn't get involved. I said that it is a that Russia is, get, is interfering through misinformation and disinformation campaigns in other countries uh, in the public domain. There were allegations concerning Russia, uh, and concerning cyber attacks. When I spoke, parliamentary leaders of the three pol major political a year ago in the spring, People spoke uh, about China and Russia. There are other countries. We saw allegations regarding India. I remember at some point in the conversation, it was, I believe, in the month of August when we were finaling, finalizing the terms of reference. Uh, we uh, concluded among ourselves uh, that we wanted uh, to give the Commission the ability uh, to lead the evidence, uh, but we used uh, the terms of other uh, state and non-state actors because uh, we want the Commission to be able uh, to establish the evidence and to uh, come to its find and to come to some findings question. So uh, the Commission was created to make sure that nothing was missed by the government in terms of Russian involvement in the last two general elections answer we're always seeking recommendations uh, in order to reinforce the already robust measures that uh, we have put in place uh, and which were appropriate during the say that it applies particularly to Russia. I am looking for regarding several um, countries, some findings uh, which deserve uh, to be looked into and uh, reviewed. about where the Commission is going to go in its findings, but uh, among the four major uh, parties, we agreed that uh, Russia was in and China were involved, uh, but they are not the only countries, and we will not comment on specific incidents of a particular country. The Commission, of course, has access to all information and uh, all evidence, uh, but I would like to be careful in the public domain. I, my last question. So we did mention uh, Russia to make sure that uh, Russia would be investigated by the Commission. Reply, we recognize that Russia is active, particularly uh, in terms of potential cyber attacks uh, and uh, disinformation and misinformation. And 
The four political parties decided to use two examples of countries uh, which were discussed a lot uh, in the public domain. But we wanted the Commission, uh, uh, for the Commission to have access to uh, all classified information, to all documents, uh, and uh, with senior officials uh, uh, who were able to brief the Commission. So in its finding, we wanted the Commission to be able to lead the evidence. Thank you. Conservative Party. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. In front of you, Minister LeBlanc. This is a news report from CTV News published June 2, 2023. And at the top, page two, the top of page two, it says, Affairs Minister Dominic Leblanc is leading a process to determine independent MP Handong's possible return to the Liberal caucus. Do you see that? 2023, you are leading a process to determine. Apologies. Commissioner, if my friend could explain how this is relevant to parts A and B of your mandate. Well, we, we've yeah, been, please. sure, we've been through this before. For, there's there's considerable controversy about uh, Mr. Dong's uh, uh, participation, willing or not, in foreign interference, and there's conflicting reports as to uh, what he did or didn't do and what he said or didn't say, and whether that gave rise to, for lack of a better term, discipline or him being forced from the Liberal caucus. So I'm asking this witness whether that, in fact, happened and whether in light of I'll come to the questions in light of the uh, special rapporteur's conclusions. Uh, that decision uh, to be excluded from caucus has been reconsidered at all. And 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 tell me what is the relationship with uh, uh, A and B of the uh, terms of reference? Because I can sure. uh, mandate of the commission, but well, we the, are the, just. Part of part of phase one is to understand inquiry. I'm going to discipline, but uh, I think. I or 2024 is all time being. So, so maybe. said publicly in the House of Commons that he voluntarily decided to withdraw uh, from the Liberal caucus when the allegations became public. He stood up one evening in the House of Commons uh, and voluntarily withdrew uh, from the Liberal caucus and asked the Speaker to sit as an independent. That was the decision that Mr. Dong made when these allegations uh, became public, and that is on the public record. Those were his words. Okay. Mr. Dong has also said since that he would like to rejoin caucus and that he's had discussions with you about the possibility of rejoining caucus. Is that correct? I think now you're pressing the line. It, it goes uh, beyond the, uh, okay. the scope of the... the, the this phase. Okay, so I'll just put the, the questions on the record. I, I appreciate your ruling. And and if it's correct that uh, Mr. Dong has requested to rejoin caucus uh, and uh, that has not yet been uh, acceded to that request, I'd like to know why. And uh, so that's the next question. I accept your ruling, Madam that's Commissioner. And I'd just like to put on the record the documents that speak to uh, uh, these questions that I've intended to ask uh, Minister LeBlanc. It's uh, COM uh, 30 
344-30, sorry, COM, 344, 345, 346, and 347. So, it's Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Madam Commissioner, we have no questions for this witness. Thank you. No questions. Thank you. Human Rights Coalition. Good afternoon. Bonjour. Uh, could we please pull up Hello. Doc 15 and turn to page four? This is going to be the institutional report prepared by Public Safety Canada. And the final bullet point on page four reads, the public safety minister is responsible for most of the federal agencies operating in the areas of national security, policing and law enforcement, border services and corrections, and conditional release, namely the RCMP, CSIS, CBSA, CSC, and PBC. The minister's role is to coordinate their activities and establish strategic priorities relating to public safety and emergency preparedness. Is this correct? Uh, yes. Is it a strategic priority to protect diaspora communities? It's always been a priority, not just of the public safety department, but of the whole government. Uh, as I learned about uh, the prevalence of foreign interference, uh, we were always struck that diaspora communities are, in many cases, the targets and the victims um, of these foreign interference attempts. So uh, it's the Public Safety Department is absolutely seized with that, as would be, for example, of CSIS and other uh, agencies. But the whole government is concerned about this. My colleague, the Minister of Diversity and Inclusion, talks to me about just my department, but the Public Safety Department is absolutely uh, concerned about this, but it goes. Uh, and if I could ask the court operator to please pull up CAN 2096. And as it's being pulled up, uh, Minister, I understand this was an election security brief provided. The first page at the third bullet point, it's under the heading. Sorry, slide. do we know the date of that? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so just under slide two, it reads, a 2016 public threat report from the Communication Security Establishment, CSE, identified political parties and politicians, electoral activities, and the media as vulnerable to threats, but also noted that our system has inherent strengths built in. For example, paper-based ballots cannot be hacked. Would you agree with this statement? In uh, I, I think our system has a lot of inherent strengths. Uh, one of them is paper-based ballots. That's probably in the context of cyber attacks. That my discussions with Elections Canada or uh, the security agencies have always been around the risk, obviously, of a cyber attack. In the case of uh, paper ballots, it's a lot easier to maintain public confidence. Uh, in in the election uh, machinery and in the outcome. I, I don't remember that before me, uh, if it was my then Deputy Minister Ian McCowan, who was a Deputy Secretary at Privy Council Office, these were ongoing conversations that I would have had with him over a number of meetings or briefings. And so, you said that it would be one of many tools in an arsenal to address the issue. Um, and with that in mind, you would agree that a paper-based ballot doesn't make an elector any less vulnerable to intimidation or harassment, which is why there needs to be other mechanisms. Uh, yeah, that's a fair statement. Great. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. AG? I have no questions. Thank you. Re-examination? No, thank you. 
J'ai une question pour vous. I have a question for you. Mr. Leblanc, you indicated during the chief examination that you learned about allegations about Mr. Chung and Mr. O'Toole only when the information was made public in 2022. And also, when you addressed another question, you said that it would not really have been useful to you when you undertook to assess to what extent the measures which were put in place had been sufficient or had been efficient. Could you indicate uh, if in your role as a minister, this type of information would have been useful to you uh, at the same time when uh, such information was identified? Question, are you speaking uh, as a minister of democratic institution? Reply, yes. As a Minister of, uh, of Democratic Institutions, and then you can speak as a Minister of Public Safety. Reply, I'm quite comfortable that, about the fact that my discussions uh, with uh, uh, the BC, BCO officials and my private discussions gave me sufficient information. Uh, uh, how we needed to evolve our measures between the 2019 and the 2021 election. For example, I was aware that there were hostile uh, actors or media platforms uh, that were using proxies uh, for intimidation purposes. At the time, I had no responsibility, operational responsibilities uh, uh, to uh, uh, follow up uh, in the case of X and Y uh, person or X and Y country uh, because uh, uh, this would have been in the hands of uh, my colleague uh, who was in charge of public safety. Um, this would have been less left to in intelligence organizations. So in my uh, general discussions with senior officials, I was convinced that I had enough information to assess a plan to protect democratic institutions. I didn't necessarily need to know that it was X candidate or uh, a city Y which were involved. It was about asking and being with CMP, the Privy Council. Had sufficient information to determine Uh, it was just uh, because of uh, as Minister for Democratic I took on uh, responsibilities as been before, the role of the Minister for Public Safety uh, uh, in terms of approving by intelligence agencies uh, the uh, questions of the uh, mandate of uh, sometimes they will inform the Minister of a threat the public safety minister, but I think it, it would not have been appropriate to be aware of such details as minister for democratic institutions. Both hats, a question. And uh, as a public sa safety minister, do you expect to be made aware of such allegations? Uh, answer, yes, absolutely. And I can assure you that in my discussions with Mr. Vigneault or his colleagues, it is the kind of discussions that they uh, have very freely with me. I, I am quite well informed on such issues. And when, if they deem it appropriate or when they need my, uh, my approval 
or uh, they are obligated to inform me. Sometimes they are required to inform me without necessarily requiring the, uh, my authorization, but uh, I am very comfortable with such exchanges now. Thank you. So no re-examination after my question. No. Uh, <laughs> Sure, I'll give you a few minutes. On va convenir de cinq minutes. We'll give you five minutes, Mr. Monceau. Good afternoon, Mr. Leblanc. Good afternoon, Alain Monceau from the Bloc Québécois. We learned through the media as well as by way of different testimony here that the Safeguard Defend a Human Rights Coalition in September of 2022 had drawn the attention of 55 uh, Chinese police stations around the world, including three here. And then the RCMP said they had conducted an inquiry on two of these police stations, one in Monday. Montreal and another one in Brassard. These two police stations seem to have engaged in interference activities uh, from those locations. So you, the minister at the time, which minister? The minister of public safety at the time. You mean my predecessor? Yes. So your predecessor mentioned, and this was reported in the media, that the two police stations in question had been closed. They had been shut down indefinitely, and we also learned that illegal activities had been carried out. And this is why those two police stations had been shut down. Can you tell us whether, indeed, those illegal activities were criminal activities? the Commission's work, which is focused on uh, Mr. Monson, can you please establish the connection you are making? Our mandate is fairly limited in this stage. In fact, you are right. Establishing is that those police for 2022 as police stations were in existence in 2019 or 2021, unless there is evidence to the contrary. I want to make sure I understand. I don't want to open a can of worms at this point, which will not be useful in this phase. What you are saying what we are looking at is uh, foreign interference. Just before or during the 2019 and 2021 elections, and what you are saying is that these Chinese police stations existed before th that time. So what connection are you establishing between the 2019 and 2020 elections and their existence? Yes, absolutely. Uh, they existed then, and we can presume there was interference because the RCMP shut them down afterwards because of So your question is, what were those illegal acts? The RCMP would only have interfered in terms of foreign interference if there had been illegal activities. We never learned about those activities. I believe the question is too general. If you can reword the question, whether to the knowledge of the minister to the 2019 and 2021 elections, I would allow that. 
as you worded it, is uh, exceeds the. Uh, if there were to this matter, and there is ongoing litigation in relation to this matter, it would not be appropriate. And then my second point is, uh, my friend has not provided any information to found the statements that he is making, that these police stations were in existence early, that they were in 2019, and it's somewhat unfair for the witness to be asked questions on a basis of a hypothetical set of circumstances that he may know nothing about. But this is the reason why I made clear that it's as far as Minister Leblanc knows, he doesn't have to speculate, uh, but if he knows uh, whether some of his alleged activities would have been uh, in relation with the elections, then this question is permitted. But I will not permit that you, you go very far with this line of questions. Do you know about any illegal acts which may have been committed from these two Chinese police stations in Mar does not determine what is a legal or illegal activity? or a judge. I believe you when you quote what the RCMP allegedly said. I would have to look into what the RCMP had in fact stated. I am about these supposed police stations. I think it is important to use supposed or alleged to qualify those stations, but I don't have any And as the government, as government counsel has said, I am not confident enough uh, to answer that, as there may be ongoing investigations. So I'm quite hesitant to answer the question on that particular issue. Thank you. We will now uh, move into break. I know that we are supposed to have a five-minute break, but in fact, it'll be more tw like 20 minutes, given the fact that witnesses will be changing and that certain security measures will have to be put into place. So I expect to be back in about 20 minutes. Thank you. Please, alors s'il vous plaît, this hearing is in recess until 3.25? 3.30. La séance est en pause jusqu'à 3h30.